On this second Sunday after Pentecost, let's be in a spirit of thanksgiving, thanking God for this beautiful crisp Sunday morning, thanking God for allowing us to be here in the sanctuary to give him his just due praise. Please rise as you are able for the call to worship. The psalmist declares, Lord, you have searched me and know me. Will you open yourselves to be searched by God? Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. God searches you, knows you, and loves you, and invites you to search out God in return. Will you seek the heart of God? We will search you, O oh God, to know your heart. The triune God who creates all and knows all is revealed in running rivers and fluttering butterflies, in warm sunshine and the smell of the earth. Will you pay attention? Will you pay attention to fingerprint our love on all of creation? Open our hearts today to encounter your love, holiness and glory that create and sustain all that was, is, and will be. We come today to enter the dance of the Trinity, the all-knowing creator and sustainer of life. Before you take your seats, let's join in singing verses one through two of hymn number 539, O Spirit of Living God, followed by hymn Number 252, when Jesus came to Jordan.
choir continues in the ministry of music, singing The Lord is My Shepherd by Thomas Matthews. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is indeed our shepherd. His goodness is with us. Let us be in prayer. Loving God, we come to you with open heart, mind, 
and soul. As the world groans from the effects of our carelessness and arrogance, you have told us to ask, and we would receive. And so we pray, guided by the gospel of love, and in the hopefulness of your tender mercies and care. And so we call out loud the names of those we lift up in prayer to you this day. Let us call those names now. And I name those listed in our worship bulletin. Angel Hernandez, David Collins, Dr. Earl Barner, Leonard White, Dr. Harold Jordan, Larry Turner, Dr. Barbara Lake, Bridget Thompson, and the people of Los Angeles, Haiti, Gaza. We pray for the sick, the troubled, the lonely, and the vulnerable. You, O oh God, know them by name. You know us by name. May your grace be enough and sufficient. We pray for all the leaders of the world that they may make decisions and be in partnership with the gospel and study war no more. Let us join in the prayer God Jesus taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture this morning is drawn from the New Testament. For today's scripture, we turn to the Message Bible translation of the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. Again, please draw your attention to John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. I've loved you the, the way my father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done, kept my father's commands and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, 
that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. This is my command. Love one another the way I have loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I am no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me. Remember, I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil, as fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives you. But remember the root command, love one another. For the word of God, for the people of God, Amen. thanks be to God. You may now be seated. The Home Inquirer will continue its ministry of music with Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, by Barry Bramman and J. Paul Williams. Following the selection, the next voice you will hear will be that of Reverend Christian Washington, who will bring the message for today to introduce the Stewardship Focused Sermon Series, Revision, with a message entitled, Discerning the Next Decade. Again, Discerning the Next Decade.
I love the celebration of those who serve us. So show some love again for the Holman Choir, for our maestro, wonderful musicians, our liturgists. Uh, as we enter June, can you believe it? Uh, uh, I am both uh, elated and feeling a little melancholy about this being my last month here. But I'm so happy to play the John the Baptist role for the phenomenal preacher and leader who is coming. I get to lay the groundwork and prepare the way. So I was, one, I was thinking and pondering, how do I close this season of preaching? And I figured uh, it makes sense to just stick with what brought you here. So repeat after me. I am significant. Because God says so. I am significant, I am significant. And, I and I was created to do significant things. Do significant. Now find someone else in the room, look them directly in the eye and tell them you are significant, you are significant. because God says so. God says so. You, are you are significant and you were created, and you were created. to do significant things. Now, as the body of Christ and Holman United Methodist Church collectively, we are significant because God says so. We are significant and we were created to do significant things. Clap your hands, O oh ye people. Clap your hands in the sanctuary. Ah, so the question becomes, question is, the question becomes, <laughs> ah, question becomes, just how do we do these significant things? So over the next four weeks after this introductory sermon, I'm going to be taking us through a decade in the life of the children of Israel to look for some clues as to how to discern our next decade, individually and collectively. What can we learn from there going from the precipice of the promised land into the promised land over the next decade of their time there? What can we learn about that? And we'll, we'll do it systematically. We'll, we'll start with the end. Next week, I'm going to talk about 10 years in the prosperity in the promised land. Promised land prosperity is next week. And it's a holistic perspe perspective on this. It's not about how much money you have. It's about having the kind of prosperity that transcends stuff and status. But I'll get to that. The next week after that, we're going to talk about five years in. And five years in, we're going to talk about promised land problems. We're going to, hit, undoubtedly, we're going to hit some speed bumps. Undoubtedly, we're going to have some issues and some things that get in the way of us being all that we can be and having the prosperity of the promised land. We're going to talk about the problems a couple of weeks from now. From that point, we're going to move it back to the first year there, that year one. And year one is promised land possibilities. They're just getting into Jericho and looking out and knowing that God has said, wherever your foot touches I'm giving to you. What are the possibilities in the promised land? And finally, the, final, the, the last week we're going to talk about when they were actually just before, just before they moved into the promised land, in the, in the land that called Gilgal, and, and what they did as promised land preparation. Prosperity, problems, possibilities, preparation. Those will be the last four words I leave with y'all over the next four weeks. But today, we're going to lead a, lay a little foundation for it all. Significant people. Because you need to know how significant you are. In our text, Jesus makes two stunning, stunning uh, announcements to his followers. First, he tells them, uh, you didn't choose me. I love how this translation puts it because it sounds like this has a little attitude with it. <laughs> Partners, y'all didn't choose me. I chose you. I want to talk a lot about that statement of Jesus choosing people. 
Second thing he said that I thought was kind of stunning was he said, uh, <laughs> I'm no longer calling you my apprentices. I'm not calling you my, my servants or my slaves. I'm calling you my friends. And I think it's going to be really interesting to get into that transition from those who followed him to people that he looked at as peers, my friends. Uh, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a friend of Jesus. That's right. I'm a, I'm a friend of Jesus. A very stunning transition. Uh, and maybe a clue as to how we should operate in this world right now. Uh, Jesus uh, came out of the wilderness after being baptized. He went to his hometown, Nazareth, and he, hooked, he posted up in his old church that he grew up in, and he was the reader that day. He said, let me read the scroll. He unleashes a scroll, unravels it, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And the main thing in that passage from Isaiah was Jesus saying, I've come to set at liberty the captive. And I've come to declare the day that God is showing up. I've come to declare Jubilee. Jubilee is that, that thing that happens in Jewish history and in Jewish law that says every 50 years we, we wipe the slate clean. All your debts are wiped out. Everything you've lost in foreclosure is returned to you. Your slate is clean. Jesus said, I came for this. What is that? What are you saying, Christian? What I'm saying is that the ultimate purpose that Jesus lays out here for his life and for ours is a destination called freedom. If you don't know this, know this now. Jesus ultimately wants us all to be free. Free indeed. But we've been living our lives mainly running to destinations that have nothing to do with the destination Jesus is talking about now. We seem to be majoring in the temporal for our destinations in life. And it usually comes down to things like status and stuff. Right? If I asked you 10 years ago, where do you think you'll be in 10 years? Where will you be in 10 years? And most likely, you're going to answer it in, well, by 10 years from now, I'll be financially independent. I'll have a certain status in life. I would have finished a few letters behind my name. I would have gotten to a place where I live in a certain place. I'm thought of a certain way. I have a certain reputation. I have a certain status. But if you're from where I'm from, I'd be telling you about the car I'd be driving, the house I'd be living in, where I'm, where I'm, I'm, I'm going to be vacationing in my vacation home and all the stuff I've acquired. I've got status and stuff. And most likely over a 10-year period, if I told you, give, tell me if everything goes well, what would it look like? You're going to hit me with status and stuff. And I think Jesus is trying to tell us in this passage and beyond that when you get to that status and stuff, what you're going to find out is it's never enough. If I asked you right now, 10 years, 10 years ago, are you in the place you thought you'd be 10 years later? You're going to answer yes or no. Yes, I've gotten all the status and all the stuff. Or no, I haven't quite gotten there. And what I'm here to declare to you is whether your answer is yes or no, you're probably not content either way. I have friends who right now own Bentley automobiles. And it was their goal and their, their raison d'etre. I'm grinding real hard all my life. I've been grinding all my life. I've been driving so hard just so I can finally get that symbol of my success, a Bentley. And I'm telling you, in both those cases, within a year of them having that Bentley, that thing was as dirty as their old car. Because <laughs> after a while, it's just a car. After a while... After people seeing you in it for about a year, they're used to you having it. It doesn't have the same effect it used to have. You used to like, you couldn't wait for the valet. <laughs> Here's my ticket. Bring my car while everybody's watching. There you go. Let that, let that Bentley just like slide up there. And, and uh, by, by the way, when you bring it around, drop the top on it too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, a year into it, you're sitting there thinking, I should have brought a bigger car. 
I'm tired of this rag top. I should have had a hard top. And I don't feel like washing this thing every day anymore. You can get used to anything. And when you get there, after a moment or two, a good moment or two, even that accoutrement of your success is just a car. And now you're thinking, is this all there is? Well, Jesus is talking about a different kind of destination, a jubilee kind of destination for your life and for the life of this church, where you're not going for success. Success comes and goes, y'all. It comes and it goes. And it's a wonderful thing. But if it's your destination, you will never be satisfied. Ah, independence. Financial independence is a wonderful thing, but I know a number of financial independent people who are miserable because the money did not solve the issue. Indep financial independence is, is, is a great thing. Don't get me wrong. It's a wonderful milestone to get to, but it's not the right destination. Like, like success is not the right destination. Significance is the right destination. Like, like uh, this independence is not the right destination. Interdependence is the right destination. When I realize that I'm here and we're here for each other and that any gifts I have and any stuff I have is really for me to be a channel of blessing for others, now I get to a certain level of fulfillment I could never get when it was just about me. Anybody hearing me right now? All right. Uh, by the way, you are, it's okay to clap, say amen, say preach it, run around if you need to. Some folks might look at you crazy, but that's all right. <laughs> Feel free to express yourself. Here we go. And success, significance. Independence, interdependence. Ah, the last one, happiness. Ah, the pursuit of happiness. But happiness comes from the root word, is the same root as happenstance. Which means that it's circumstantial. You can, be, you can be having the happiest day, the happiest moments of your life, and a phone call could take all that happiness away in a moment's time. Somebody's sick. Somebody passed. There's a diagnosis. It doesn't matter. Your, your business has an issue. It doesn't matter. It's not an eternal thing. Success is circumstantial. It's not what we're talking about here. For Jesus is talking about something that's not circumstantial, something that has nothing to do, it's not subject to what's going on in your life or not in your life. Jesus is saying it's not, the destination is not this circumstantial happiness. It is freedom. The world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. It's the kind of freedom that says that, I may not be all that I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. It's, it's a, the kind of freedom that says that you can throw anything you need to throw at me. It might change my circumstances, but it's not changed my reality. The reality is I'm free. You just a problem. Y'all with me here? Stick, stick with me. I'm going somewhere. I'm laying, laying a foundation. Laying a foundation. The text was one that I really enjoy. Uh, and, and in it again, it, it talks about Jesus choosing us. That we didn't choose him, he chose us. First point from that text I want to leave with you. And write this down if you're writing stuff down. Get this online if you're getting this online. If you're listening on KJLH, how you doing? Shout out to Stevie. <laughs> KJLH, how you doing? Uh, here's the first point. Big one. You need to learn how to be content with being chosen. To find contentment in being chosen. Everybody say, I'm chosen. Uh, I, need, I, need, I, need to get you, I need to get you on this one. Jesus said, uh, you didn't choose me. And I grew up in a, a world about having a personal relationship with God. I grew up with the four spiritual laws. I grew up with Jesus coming. I grew up with Calvinist friends who said that Je God's predetermined it all. You're either chosen or you're not. I grew up with uh, Seventh-day Adventist friends. I'm sorry, uh, Jehovah's Witness friends who said, hey, look, there's only a, a number that's been numbered. 
If you're not part of that 144,000, I grew up with a whole lot of exclusivity about our religion and that chosen was something that was way beyond us. Jesus is clarifying, the chooser is God. However, let me just make this really, really clear on this. We can get it, we can become very myopic and closed and exclusivist about this choosing that we don't have anything to do with. Ah, y'all know my story. I'm, I am the 29th foster child and now adopted, and, and the second adopted child of Dorothy and Poindexter, Washington. That I was abandoned at birth, I was put right into the foster care system, and a family in Compton uh, that had had 28 foster children before me took me in. If I ever wrote a memoir, it would be called Number 29. Uh, and, and they adopted the, the first one, Shirley, my sister, 11 years before, had all these babies in between, and here comes this little chocolate drop with a big mouth. And they said, we're keeping this one. This is our little buddy. You know, I know what it's like to be chosen. I know what it's like that in the whole milieu of kids out there, God fashioned for me to be moved from here into that water for, for Pharaoh's daughter to come pull me out and choose me and choose me. I know what it's like for someone to choose me permanently to make a covenant between God and the government, I'm taking care of this one, and that covenant be irrevocable. I know what it's like to be chosen. God chooses us. But here's the thing. Here's where even I got it twisted for so long. I thought that somehow God choosing me this way made me some kind of extra special. I thought that being a Christian made us some kind of extra special to God. That God only chooses people who say the magic seven words and get in some water. Or get some water sprinkled on them. You want to know if you're chosen? Uh, I, I take you to the gospel according to the color purple. A story of how God chooses. Ha! So the story, I, we, we, went, uh, we went to the uh, play well, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. We went to the play and saw the play, The Color Purple, the one that won the, the Tonys. And it's, it's a lot of songs that aren't in the, in the movie, of course, but a lot of the dialogue is ripped directly from the movie. And if you're like me, I know that movie backwards. So I walk into this play and I feel like I'm in the play. Because I'm doing the dialogue. All my life I had to fight. I'm, 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 I'm right with her. Like, okay. Yeah. You told Harpo to beat me. I'm sure I, I could have just jumped on stage and said, I, I'm going to do all the dialogue. I'm going to let them do all the acting. I'm, I got this, y'all. <laughs> Harpo, who this woman? Right? <laughs> she scratches out my, uh, my hair while I'm ailing. Sister. I mean, I mean, I know that backwards. And I love the fact that it moves from a, a, a place where we meet this woman, Celie. And Celie is a victim. She's victimized and, tra and traumatized. She's essentially a slave, a concubine. She has no rights. She has no privileges. She is the sum total of her trauma and what's happening to her. We meet Celie at the beginning of the, of the show. But by the end of the show, her name has changed. Her name is now Miss Celie. And there's a big difference between Celie and Miss Celie. First, they add something to the front of her name, M-I-S-S, -S, not M-S. There's no M-S back then. It was M-I-S-S, -S, which symbolizes single female, which says, I ain't her anymore. I'm Miss Seely now. I'm not that tyrant's wife anymore. I'm not that victim anymore. I'm a survivor. I'm going to make it. I'm a survivor. Keep on surviving. I am Miss Seely over here. But in the play, 
they add something that, that uh, dramatizes even more with a song, one of my favorite lines in the whole movie. It's when she's, she's already hexed the dude. Right. And now she's on the back of a, of a, of a buckboard. She's on the back of a horse-drawn kind of carriage thing. Uh, and she's riding away. And she says, I might be black. I may be ugly. Might be un, uneducated. But I'm here. Oh, thank God. I'm here. See, what I didn't realize was that if you're here, there's hope. That there's something existentially valuable about just being here. That the gospel is not some only so many folk going to get it. The gospel, the real good news is that Jesus paid it all already. The real good news is that Jesus has chosen you whether you understand that or recognize it or not. Our job is to wake the world up to that. Our job is to let you know it's already happened. Jesus already chose you. Wake up and receive that. You are chosen. If you're walking around here with breath, if you're walking around here with life, that is God sustaining your life for a purpose. Not only are you significant, you are chosen. And it's in that choice, it's in that being chosen. Remember, you don't choose him. Oh, it is not the words or the incantations you say. It is not the amount of water. If you don't have that change of heart, you can go in as much water as you want. All you got was wet. It's recognizing that this is not your choice. It's you receiving a choice that Jesus chose you. He chose you with his life, his heart, his blood, his death, and his resurrection. He chose the world. It's our job to wake the world up. It's our purpose to let folks know that there's good news. Ah, Want another way to know that you're chosen? Lift your right hand in the air. Right hand in the air. Want to know you're chosen? Right hand in the air. Put that right hand right in front of your face and say your name. Did you feel breath on your hand? Then you're chosen. If you're here, you're chosen. God sustains you with this breath. No breath, no life. If you're not breathing, you're not living. The ancients believed that the the sound of our breath is actually the name of God. Yahweh, Yahweh. They wouldn't say the name of God, but they believed that the fact that we are breathing, the fact that we're being sustained at every breath, we are actually praying. We're actually saying the name of God with every breath. When you have that hand in front of your face, if you feel breath, Not only are you significant, not only is God sustaining you, but God has chosen you. Say, I'm chosen. Say, I'm chosen. You have to find find contentment with being chosen. Paul put it this way. I, I have found that I've been up, I've been down, I've been in prison, I've been in prison, I've been through all kinds of things. But I've learned that in all things, in all ways, I am content. I love that word. I love that idea. I'm up, I'm down. It does not, it may change my spatial reality, but it does not change my existential reality. I'm still chosen. I'm still significant even when things aren't going well. I'm still chosen and significant when things don't go my way. I'm still chosen and significant. Our lives are not very different than my first careers training about portfolios of stocks and bonds. Our lives are not very different. You can buy a portfolio today and it can be 10 years from now twice what you bought it for, three times what you bought it for. But I'm telling you right now, baby, it will not be some smooth ride up there. 
while the trajectory might be going up and the general direction is up, you're going to get some volatility. In this life, Jesus said, there will be trouble. Hello? But, you're gonna, but I have overcome it all. And so will you. Ah, this volatility is just part of the process, but does not change the fact that you're chosen. Now you have to find contentment in the volatility and contentment in the fact that you're chosen. I got one more point and I'll get out of your way. Second thing Jesus made very clear is that we're his friends. And what he said about it was kind of interesting. My, my translation is that the reason why you know you're my friends is I gave you the playbook. If I was going to just continue to lord over you, then I'd just sit here. I'd know all it. I'd know all the answers. i call all the plays. You just follow what I tell you, and that's the way it goes. No, I gave you the playbook. I've taught you the, the way we do it. I've taught you the way I see things. I've shown you what the, what, the, uh, what the work is that you're here to do, and here is the playbook for it. Take that. Go. You're my friends. Go get it done. Ah. I want you to get to that destination called freedom. I want you to take a world with you to that destination called freedom. But you need to understand this, and this is my second and final point. It is, it is very, very important and very, very necessary that in all that you do, you make the daily decision to do the right thing. Oh, well, I, I, know, I know. Look, Spike Lee said it first. I, I get it. Yeah, but, but if, you're, if you're taking notes, the way it would show up in my manuscript would be right decisions lead to right destination, right? Making the daily right decisions. We have a crossroad decision every day. I, I know I do. I, I, maybe you do too. But there's a crossroads decision we face almost every day. Left, right, up, down, stay, go, stay together, break up. Cuss them out or not. <laughs> Cuss her out or not. <laughs> Kill the person who cut me off in the parking lot. I know. Daily decisions. Do I do that workout or not? Do I, do I not eat that 15th donut or not? <laughs> Daily decisions. Do I erase that name from my phone or not? Do I block that person or not? Bring it to today a little bit. Every day, we've got crossroads decisions, but every right decision you make, the consistency of making right decisions leads you to the right destinations. <sighs> but somehow, in the midst of that, I realize that there needs to be a little bit of a mind shift. We are built on having a scarcity mentality in this world, especially in the Western world. There's only so much pie. There's only so much we can get. There's only so much I can, I, that can good happen for me. I got to get mine. You got to get yours. And if you get yours, don't forget about that crabs in the barrel. Huh? If you get yours and somehow I don't get mine. We're locked in that vicious cycle of there's only so much and not enough. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. In Jesus, there's no lack. And in, in Jesus, there's no lack. And that's not talking about material stuff and status. That's talking about there's no lack of peace. There's no lack of purpose. There's no lack of freedom in Jesus, which gives you the resilience to actually get those things done. But to know to, get, to know that you're going to get there, you have to start with knowing you can. Uh, anybody ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? You know, one of the key things that's the difference between a rich dad and a poor dad is a rich dad pours into his children, they can do it. That it is expected that they do it. It's expected that they excel. It's expected that they be good citizens. It's expected that they save. It's expected that they invest. It's expected that they start their own business and have streams of income. These are the things that come from the rich dad mentality. It's a mentality. You follow? You know, we need to have the kind of mentality that Jesus is trying to put into these disciples. Jesus is being rich dad right now. You're my friends. I chose you, 
Go be fruitful. Love one another. He's given them the rich dad speech. Here's your rich dad speech, y'all, as I close. Making the good decision every day is saying that I'm committed to the purposes that God put me here for. Now, those purposes sometimes are things we know and sometimes we find out through trial and error. But if I know I'm chosen, hear this. By being chosen, you need to know your yes is coming. Oh, if you catch this one, I hope that got online. I hope that got on the, on the broadcast. KJLH, your yes is coming. You need to get this. Here's human nature. I got my purpose. I'm supposed to go over here and get my purpose. I walk in this door. This door needs me. This door, behind this door is where my purpose can be worked out the most. I am the solution to the problems behind this door. Knock, 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 knock. If I get a no there... Human nature says, I quit. Must be the wrong one. Must be the wrong purpose. Maybe this isn't what I want to do. Maybe this isn't what I should be doing. I thought I heard from God. Maybe it's wrong. But I'm telling you, if you know your yes is coming, I mean, if you wake up every day knowing my yes is coming, it may not come today, but I'm going to knock on this door. And if they say no, I'm going to say, fine, I'm going to knock on this door. No, fine, I'm going to knock on this door because I know my yes is coming. No, I'm going to knock on this door. I'm, I'm going to knock on this door. How many doors have you knocked on for your purpose? How many doors have you knocked on when God said, this is what you're here to do? And you keep going till you get a yes. Here's the thing. Your yes is coming. Some people in here already have heard their yes, and they're sitting here going, yes, let me tell you. They can testify. I've had my yes. I've had multiple yeses in my life. Let me tell you about yeses. But for everybody else who's sitting here going, when is my yes coming? Let me tell you what you need to do. You just keep, keep knocking. You keep knocking on the next door and the next door, next door. Jesus put it this way. You sweep the dust off your feet. And you knock on another one. And you knock on another one until you get your yes. Why is your yes guaranteed? Why is your yes coming? Your yes is coming because you're chosen. For those who are chosen, there is a yes waiting for you. There's a yes that is somewhere on the other side of how many doors you're going to knock on. Because the door that God wants you to go through is going to be one of those doors. And it may not be the one you think it's going to be. It may not be with the people you think you're going to have it with. Sometimes the ones you think are going to say yes, or the ones say no. But sometimes the one you thought was going to say no. You wrote that note to Oprah, and you got a return from her. Look, I, this stuff happens all the time. There's someone in our Wednesday night class, uh, I'll, I'll end on this, who uh, says that, she believes after a stunning career as a professional person in this world that now her passion is to be an actor, right? And, and as soon as she said that, I said, well, you know, you know the playbook for that one, right? <laughs> you know the playbook for that one? <laughs> you keep knocking till you get that yes. And you're going to get a lot of no's. And you're going to get a whole lot of rejection. There's nobody standing here now with, with Emmys and Grammys and Tonys who won't tell you how many auditions they went to. It's a wonderful metaphor for this. You're supposed to be starting a nonprofit that helps some people that you really identify with and you haven't had, you haven't had anybody write a big check with. Who cares? Keep asking. Keep serving the ones right in front of you. Keep working out your purpose every day and keep knocking on the doors. Because when the right door opens up, oh my gosh, it goes to a place beyond what you can imagine or think or ask. You think you know what's going to be going on in the next 10 years. You think you do. But God has something so much more fulfilling, so much more purposeful, so much more that will leave you in a place where you've left a legacy in this world. But to do that, it starts with a daily practice. I'm going to make the right decision. I'm going to, at this crossroads, go the right direction. I'm going to do the right thing. Knowing 
that my yes is coming. Say my yes is coming. Say my yes is coming. Say my yes is coming because I'm chosen. Say it with your chest. I'm chosen. See, I don't know who that's for. Somebody right now feels the furthest from chosen they could. I hear you right now, but baby, my New Orleans came out, baby, I stopped by to tell you, as the old preacher would say, I was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, seed begging for bread. I'm here to tell you that if the 29th foster child of the Washingtons is standing here as the interim senior pastor of one of the most significant churches in all of Los Angeles, then there's a yes waiting for you. There is a yes waiting for you. Oh, God bless you as we come to this table today. I want you to see communion a little bit differently. I want you to see communion as you in the space in that text where you're at a table with Jesus and Jesus tells you, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Break some bread with the the God that chose you. Drink some wine with the one who says, you're not my slaves, you're my friends. Come hang out with your friend Jesus And he's going to tell you the same thing I'm telling you. It's the time of Jubilee. It's the time for you to get out there. Oh, as some other prophets once say, to get up, get out, and do something. It's the time to live into your promise. And the promise is you are significant. And you're here to do significant things. Clap your hands, all you people. Clap your hands if you're chosen. Clap your hands if you're significant. Amen. As we transition to this table with our friends, our liturgist will lead you in the Apostles' Creed. Prepare yourself and prepare your your spirit to partake. Apostles' Creed, number 881 in the hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. You may be seated and turn to page 12 in our United Methodist hymnal, the the, uh, red hymnal, uh, to a service of word and table, our communion liturgy for the day. Christ our Lord invites us to his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not lived with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We've prayed collectively as a body. Now, 
you might have an individual confession that you'd like to make to God. This moment of silence is for you. Make your confession now. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It's right. It is is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you father almighty creator of heaven and earth and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven we praise your name and join in their unending hymn holy 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 lord god of power By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and by the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you, given for you, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they did eat. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of those, of these, your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us the body of Christ and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And we all said, Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Take the bread, brothers. This is the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, broken for you. Take it, eat it. And every time you do, remember. Now take the cup. 
in this cup is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, and every time you do, remember. We'll now serve those who serve us. take the bread beloved this is the body of Christ broken for you take and eat and every time you do remember Christ says remember me and now the cup in this cup is the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins now take drink and every time you do Remember, Christ wants you to remember. Now rise in God's grace. Go in God's peace. The table of Christ is open to all. Come and partake. good my truck that's good is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, and every time you do, remember. Jesus says, remember me. They did eat. And now the cup. In the cup you have it before you is the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take, drink, all of it and every time you do remember Jesus says remember me now rise beloved in the grace of God and go in God's peace Come to the table, kneel as you're able. Take the bread, beloved. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat. And every time you do, remember, Jesus says, 
remember me. And now the cup. This is the cup of Christ, the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take, drink, and every time you do, remember. Jesus says, remember me. Now rise in God's grace and go in God's peace. Come to the table, beloved. Kneel as you're able. Now take the bread. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Now take, eat, and every time you do, remember. Jesus said, remember me. Now take the cup. It's the cup of Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take, drink, all of it. And every time you do, remember, Jesus says, remember me. Now rise in the grace of God and go in God's peace. table, beloved. Kneel as you're able. Take the bread. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat all of it. And every time you do, remember, Jesus says, remember me. Now take the cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take, drink, drink all of it. And every time you do, remember, Jesus says, remember me. Now rise in God's grace, beloved, and go in God's peace. Take the bread. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat all of it in remembrance of me. And now the cup. It's the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins take drink all of it and every time you do remember Jesus says remember me now rise beloved in the grace of God 
and go to the back pew in your peace. Choir, take the bread. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, all of it in remembrance of Christ. And now the cup is the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take, drink, all of it. And every time you do, remember. Jesus says, remember me. stank on the end there yeah. as we close this time of a lovely family meal let us pray God who is the chooser we are grateful for being the chosen as we partake in the remembrance of your sacrifice for us in the sacrifice you made for this world help us to live into your promises Help us to live into our chosenness. Help us to make right decisions, to reach the destinations you have set out for each of us. And in all of this, in all of this, we will be careful to make our lives about your glory, to make our deeds about your glory, to make even our successes about your glory. We turn it all over to you in loving surrender as your friends. In the matchless and majestic name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. During this moment in our service, when we receive offerings, I acknowledge the Walker family sponsorship on May 26th radio broadcast on Radio Free. KJLH FM 102.3 with the following dedication. In celebration of dear Dr. Betty Davis Walker, happy blessed birthday, May 27th, to our loving wife, grandmother, great grandmother, and champion of children around the world. God loves you and so do we. From your loving husband, Hal, and Raymond and Allison, Roshana, Justin, Kara, Lance, Niall, Mecca, Asia, and all the Walker and Davis family, we thank God for you. To God be the glory. I invite you to consider all ways of giving. Drop off your envelope as you leave the sanctuary. Make a secure online Donation with Giftly or Vanco. Scan the QR code on the back of your worship bulletin or send a check to the address listed on the front of the bulletin. Take advantage of the radio broadcast sponsorship discount available through June. Join the walkers in sharing the message with those who are sick, shut in, or far away. Or adorn the altar with a spray of flowers to celebrate an occasion, or honor a loved one. There are many avenues of giving. Prayerfully consider them and let your heart lead you to the one that best honors your relationship with God. We thank you for your continued generosity in support of the mission and vision of Holman United Methodist Church. Our announcements are as follows. On Wednesday night, life concludes this Wednesday, June 5th. Come to White Hall at 6.30 p.m. for refreshments, followed by goal setting and a 90-day action plan. Remember to visit the Holman website and sign up 
for our all church retreat, which will be held on Saturday, June 8th, beginning at 10 a.m. The link to join in active at the Holman website is on the bulletin and in the e-ringer. If you need help registering, please feel free to call the office at 323-703-5868 and someone will gladly assist you. If you had fun at Mother's Day, come back for Father's Day. On June 16th, Holman United Methodist Men will honor the fathers who've achieved milestones in age, family generations, and number of children, but they have to be present for the recognition. So children, bring your fathers and your father figures to church, and fathers bring the family, then join us after service for fun in LL White Hall. As we come to a close, please connect with us as we gather for dynamic worship, grow through inspired learning, and go into joyful service to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your continued partnership in ministry. God bless you, and have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. service, I gave them some homework that I want to give you as well. And if, can you remember the, the, if you can remember 2020, you'll remember the homework. Uh, first is that during this last month I'm here, I'd like to see if you can create a habit of spending at least 20 minutes a day with God. Some people will call it your quiet time. Some people will call it devotional time. Some people may just listen to an app reading the scriptures to them. Some might do a guided, some kind of guided meditation on, the, on, on an app. However you find that time, dedicate 20 minutes at least a day throughout this month to just spending time with God, shutting down everything else. Second thing is I want, as we move into doing significant things, I want you to spend 20 hours this month working on your significant thing, whatever that might be. That's just one hour a day, five days a week. But if you're applying to a, a, a doctoral program like me, then I, I'm going to use that time to be applying to that program. If you're writing a book, start writing chapters. Start working on your outline. Start working on those things. If you're starting a nonprofit, get those proposals together. Get those grant proposals together. But work on what's important and it, what God has you doing. That also means that some of y'all might feel like or know that it's time for you to get back involved here. Some of those 20 hours, we'd love to see you here serving, using your gifts here, filling this place up with folks who are saying, I'm on purpose. 20 hours a week, 20 hours a month, working on your purpose and your significant thing. 20 minutes a day, working on your relationship with God. Ah, that's a great way to close. God bless you.
that you have enjoyed our broadcast today and that it met a spiritual need in your life. If it was helpful, you can support this radio ministry by donating online at holmanchurch.com or by calling the church office at 323-703-5868. Again, that's 323-703-5868 or online at holmanchurch.com. That's H-O-L-M-A-N, holmanchurch.com. Today's radio broadcast was sponsored by the Davis and Walker families in celebration. Holman Church is located at 3320 West Adams Boulevard. That's Adams Boulevard and 4th Avenue in the historic West Adams District of Los Angeles. We wish God's blessing on you to have a wonderful week and thank you for sharing this time with the Holman United Methodist Church on radio station KJLH 102.3 102.3 FM and everywhere on the internet via the Holman Church YouTube channel. Remember, you can contribute and find out more about us at holmanchurch.com. We hope to hear from you and see you soon.